Okay, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, tricuspid valve stuff, a little bit of functional imaging. Try to get us a little back on time. Okay. Uh, so tricuspid valve assessment, severity, and interventions. So we had some good talks this morning already about tricuspid valve, so this is not new to us. Um, just to remind you, just like the mitral situation, the tricuspid is all about the apparatus, not just the leaflets. So we have to be considering the subvalvular apparatus, the LV, I'm sorry, the RV uh, shape and geometry. Um, primary TR, um, it, it's really you know, estimated only be about 20% of the problem, but that's, we certainly do see myxomatous degeneration, including prolapse. Uh, injury from uh, device leads, uh, injury from uh, transplant biopsies. When they come back uh, with you know, nice healthy cordal tissue, that's a bad outcome, but it does happen. Um, and then more rare things, thankfully. So tricuspid annulus, much like the mitral, it's saddle-shaped. Um, you've seen graphics like this already. Dr. Ramachandani showed us very nicely this anatomy in the, in the surgical talk he gave this morning. Um, it is a little less saddle-shaped than the mitral, but it is still nonetheless saddle-shaped. And the important thing, and it's a different orientation than what he showed, but you know, when we look at the atrial septum in the middle, we have the septal, the anterior, and the posterior leaflets. And we've talked about how really the tricuspid annular dilation it really just follows the ventricular dilation. So it's attached to that sort of lateral free wall, uh, and that's where we have dimensions going out like this. Now, one of the things that's interesting when you talk about functional TR, which is about 80% of all the TR we have to deal with is functional. Um, you know, how do you get there? And there's only a few ways to get there. You can get chronic atrial fibrillation, gives you an annular dilation, and then a secondary um, uh, TR from the annular dilation. You can get a whole host of things, generally on the left side, that give you increased atrial pressure. That can certainly do it. Uh, and pulmonary diseases. But really, at the end of the day, they all dilate your tricuspid annulus or they dilate your ventricle primarily, which then gives you secondary or functional TR. And this is just another graphic showing sort of the flattening that you get of the annulus and the shape uh, of where the uh, dilation occurs. And this graphic on the right is probably the one that matters because when we talk about things like mitroclip therapy, these are often uh, targeted towards the septal and anterior uh, leaflets of the tricuspid. So a little bit about imaging. So it's a little tough to see, and, and I must say in the echo world we've been a little lazy uh, for decades around the tricuspid valve. We sort of know there's three leaflets, we look at the leak, um, but because we didn't have interventions necessarily, we didn't spend a lot of time trying to differentiate the mechanism of the leak. Um, so that's changed recently. So this is the sort of the classic view you've seen already, septal, anterior, posterior leaflets, from an echo perspective, what are we looking at? So if you do a four-chamber classic echo view and you see the tricuspid valve, that's your cut plane. It's right through there. If you do a two-chamber view, that's your cut plane through there. And when you do your RV inflow view, that's your cut plane. So which scallops are you seeing in each of those views? Well, it shows you here. So if this is your RV inflow view, you're going to get the anterior scallop and one of the other ones. And it's hard to know because there's a lot of individual variation. So you can guarantee you've got anterior, plus something else. On the four-chamber view, you're going to get septum all the time, plus something else. And it's hard to know which one. And the two-chamber view, you're going to get posterior and one of the other ones. So really, if you're going to memorize anything, and, and few people do, um, but these are the relatively specific views for individual scallops. So that's something that sort of, we got to post it in the echo lab and kind of go through it several times. And, and ultimately, when you have, really is important when you have uh, prolapse. Uh, or individual leaflet dysfunction or vegetation. But most of the time, it's functional, and it tends to be this posterior leaflet sort of moving out in a way. That's the most common mechanism we're all going to see. So in 2D, it's very difficult to, to visualize the three leaflets simultaneously. Uh, it's difficult to know which leaflet in any given view, with the exception of those special images I just showed you. Um, but what do we call significant dilation? So we heard again this morning about 40 millimeters in that four-chamber view. Uh, or if you index it, uh, 21 millimeters. So 40 millimeters is basically the benchmark that most use in a four-chamber view for determining annular dilation. There's been a great study by Roberto Lang and his group in Chicago, sort of using uh, transthoracic 3D. Um, this is one of the great applications of transthoracic 3D imaging, is actually to look at the tricuspid valve because it's so anterior. It's the exact opposite on a TE uh, when you're far from the tricuspid valve. But on the transthoracic, um, if you practice it and get good at it, you can actually identify in a reasonable proportion of patients all three scallops looking from above or from below. So quantitating TR, that's a tough assignment. 
um, partly because it's tough to image the RV. Uh, it's tough to image the individual tricuspid leaflets. Um, the leaflet scallops, as I mentioned, identification is tough. But, this, but the TR severity is important to quantify. And the reason is, this is one paper from a few years ago that looked at basically survival over time uh, from a benchmark quantitation of the TR severity. And if you look at that, this is the EOA defined if it was less than 40 or greater 40, sort of a binary distribution of severity. But an EOA greater than point, or greater than 0.4 centimeters, uh, you've got a significant difference in your survival out to 10 years. And even, you know, it splits off very, even in one year, they look different. So you can prognosticate survival based on a quantitation of TR severity. And even if you look at those that are symptomatic and asymptomatic, it doesn't matter. In every category, uh, you can differentiate prognosis on TR severity. So it's not benign, it's not incidental, it shouldn't be the last line of the echo report, oh yeah, by the way, there's a bunch of TR. Um, severe TR at any stage, symptomatic or asymptomatic, is associated with poor prognosis and that's independent of age, LV function, RV function, and RV size. So TR always matters. It doesn't mean you can always do something, but it always matters. So this is the guideline, uh, one of the guidelines that came out just a little over a year ago. Um, ASC and multiple societies, including cardiovascular, or, uh, CMR societies, um, and it sort of looked at the different ways to quantify TR. So we all, we all use the color. You sort of, the bigger the color, uh, the more severe it is probably. Uh, you've heard about CW, and Dr. Quinones gave us a lot of the, the pearls and pitfalls for Doppler lesions, but clearly that applies to tricuspid as well. Very simply, the, the more dense and triangular um, the tricuspid uh, CW signal, the more likely it is to be a significant lesion. Um, high velocity um, often equates, or should equate to pulmonary pressure, but when you go wide open TR, that relationship falls apart in terms of the estimation of RV systolic pressure. So we have color quanti qualitative features, you have CW features, and you can look at hepatic veins. Um, one of the things that's really challenging is PISA. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around PISA, and I won't get into the, the, the weeds of echo too much, but we use PISA on the left side for the mitral uh, with reasonable comfort, particularly when it's primary MR, when the assumption of a circular hole is not too far off. Primary MR, you might have a circle-ish or an, at least elliptical uh, orifice. But in TR, particularly when 80% of it's functional, the hole is this irregular shape, doesn't look anything like a circle. So the PISA assumption to estimate an actual EOA uh, is usually wrong. Um, Nonetheless, this is, a, this is straight out of the guidelines. It's sort of helpful to say if there's a bunch of features that are mild, such as a thin vena contracta, uh, a small central color jet, um, A dominant uh, flows, that's probably mild. On the other hand, if there's a whole bunch of features collecting that suggest severe, and they're shown here, uh, both color and CW features, it's severe. Uh, and in the middle, when it's indeterminate or moderate, um, that's when you can put some effort into doing some quantitation. But I must say, the quantitation is tough. Um, and these are the ones when you're worried about, you know, what is the quantitation, particularly if you're going to consider doing an intervention, uh, that's where the role for CMR um, comes into play. And I think that's what Eric just said, is sort of when you have uh, uncertainty around your quantitation, but it matters, CMR can be useful. So I'd say when multiple parameters are concordant, the TR grade can be determined with fairly high probability. So this is an example going through one case. You see that there's a RV dilation. You've got a CW here. Uh, you've got a measure of the, the, uh, the flow convergence radius. You can plug that into the EOA formula that we all use. You can look at hepatic vein flow and see systolic flow reversal. And this is an example where we have a huge EOA uh, and a fairly large regurgitant volume. So getting to management, this is where things get tricky. So in the tricuspid side, so we'll just look at this guideline for a second. And this is the 14 guideline. It didn't change in the update in 17. Um, so you've got tricuspid regurgitation. Let's look at what you're supposed to do. So if it's symptomatic and severe and primary, OK, that's reasonable. So this is, again, only about 20% of the patients with severe symptomatic TR. If it's functional and you're going to surgery, that's a good time to do something. You're doing surgery for other reasons. Go ahead, to fix the tricuspid. Uh, if it's a reoperation uh, and you've got a preserved RV, then that's reasonable to do something. Asymptomatic uh, at the time of surgery, that's fine. 
uh, or if it's primary with RV dysfunction, again, the ventricular dysfunction is your, is your indicator, it's okay. But if we ask the question going through all of this, uh, well, actually, I'll ask the question in a second. So I'll give you the case that we're going to ask the question around. So this is somebody we treated a little while ago, 77-year-old male referred for decompensated heart failure, refractory ascites, anasarca, uh, history of significant, um, he, he had a partial gastrectomy, prostate cancer, hypertension, chronic AF, um, his echo showed uh, preserved LV systolic function, moderate to severe dilation of the RV with some TR. And let's see if this plays. Huh. I'm going to go back and forward again. Okay. Well, it doesn't play when it's plugged into the projector. Okay. All that matters is in this view down here, there's an ocean of color. <laughs> um, there's a lot of TR in the bottom right image. Uh, don't know why that's not doing Okay. So go back to the guidelines and let's plug this patient into these guidelines and it'll tell us what to do. So it's severe functional TR and somebody not going for surgery. And the guidelines say to do what? Nothing. So if it's functional and he's having surgery, there's a suggestion. Uh, if he's functional, uh, even if he's asymptomatic, there's a suggestion. And there really isn't a branch board that says if he's functional uh, and symptomatic and severe and is not having surgery, there's no recommendation. There's nothing to do. So when you ask the guidelines for help, you get really nothing. It doesn't tell you what to do. Everything is at the time of left-sided surgery. Okay, so this is our guy. Still doesn't play. Okay. So that's the bottom line. What do the guidelines recommend for severe symptomatic stage D functional TR when the patient is not also going for left-sided surgery? Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like this room right before the break. Crickets. <laughs> There's no advice. All right? So that's why we, we're having these talks on novel therapies, because we need therapies. We need something for this population. Uh, the surgical risks are high. The guidelines looks at that and says, well, we're not going to recommend something with unproven um, impact, but with proven risk. So that's why there are no guidelines for these, for these patients. And you've heard this already, so I'll go quickly. Uh, there's a lot of different approaches to these devices. Um, Dr. Tang took us through this better than I can. Uh, what I really want to get to is a case that we did just to show you an example of how this can be useful. Um, this is a particular patient. We didn't do this case. This is a trialine device. Um, that has gotten fairly far. It's passed its first 25 patients, um, but just basically showing a no cooptation. Um, this is that bicuspidization approach using catheters only with a pledgeted suture, uh, and you go from this to start off with to this. So a significant improvement, a remarkable improvement, I would say, for this particular case. Um, so for our particular guy, the catheter-based intervention was considered. Um, we thought about doing a mitra clip because that's a procedure that we have access to and a technology we have access to. Um, in this case, we actually did do a 3D print because this was early in our experience and the field has moved to mostly targeting a clip across the septal and anterior leaflets. Most of the time, that's the way to go. That's the largest co-optation zone. That's one thing we've learned in the last few years, two years probably within the tricuspid space. So at that time when we did this case, we didn't have that collective uh, global knowledge, so we had to figure it out, and we, we tried to print to help us out. This was a, a remarkable case in that the 3D imaging was actually pretty good. So I fully acknowledge this is the exception, this is not the rule. Uh, but this is the view from the RV, this is the view from the RA. Uh, that black stuff down the middle is the large central co-optation defect. You don't need the color on here, so I'm glad these videos play. Um, so that we knew what we were dealing with. We still didn't know exactly what to target looking at these scallops, which one is the one that we should stick a clip across. We're not gonna put a clip across all three at once. We can only get two of them. Um, so this is sort of the view. This color works for reasons I don't know. It didn't work on the previous slide. It's the same image, now it works, but there's the severe TR. This is the mitra clip going in. This is the small clip, the classic clip, not the new clip that's slightly longer. Um, and this is the attempt at the grasp. Uh, and here we are, so this is sort of, I won't sort of go through all these details. There's the final tissue bridge that we achieved. So this was a short three hours later. Um, it felt longer. And that video doesn't play. That's a good one not to play because not much happens except you see the clip. But there it is. Oh, this one should have played. 
So there was an improvement in the TR. That's frustrating. Um, so um, it wasn't gone though. There was still TR, but it was better. So, the, so there's the before and classically, I won't show you the after, but it was better. But this was a case, long procedure. Um, okay, there we go. We, had, we said it was at least moderate TR at the end. The echo, frankly, was kind of ugly. You know, we were done and we were like, that's more color than we like. That's a bit disappointing. Um, how are we gonna make this procedure better? But the patient had a, a very impressive clinical response. Uh, within the course of a couple of days in hospital, he lost over 30 pounds. So refractory to diuresis, clip, massive diuresis. Did it last, his clinical benefit? Not really. At six months, he was back in heart failure. Um, but an early experience. Um, so these are the guidelines. I showed you these already. Severe TR, and this is the concept, and this is the conversation that's happening um, a lot these days in the tricuspid space, is we have this notion of severe TR. It gets back to what we heard about earlier about prognosis. And the discussion really is, should we have categories over here? Should we identify torrential TR and massive TR as the two categories above severe TR? Um, that's a concept. Maybe we just call severe TR worse. Um, or maybe we just acknowledge that TR is a continuum that doesn't like any of the buckets we're trying to give it, and that maybe our endpoint should be a 50% reduction in the volume, whatever the volume is to begin with. Uh, the total unknowns is if you move somebody from massive to severe, do they have a mortality benefit? Do they have a quality of life benefit? Uh, that's the frontier we don't have answers to yet. So there's a summary. Well, the one thing that is important in relation to the co-op, I just want to give a little commentary. So we were lucky in the co-op was positive because imagine if the co-op study had been negative, what would have happened to the field of tricuspid interventions? Dead. Dead, yeah. 80% of, of TR, so if you can't make somebody feel better by improving their functional mitral regurgitation, how the hell are you gonna spend a whole lot of money and effort on the tricuspid to try to develop a technology that you think will be dead? So that's maybe an, an unsung benefit of a positive co-op study is that this field still exists. Um, anyway, so for the, for the tricuspid valve, you've gotta consider the RV and the tricuspid anatomy. It is very important, just in the mitral space, to distinguish primary from secondary. You have to have a reasonable estimate of the TR severity, acknowledging that it's difficult. Um, recognize that severe TR is always associated with a bad prognosis in every single person. Uh, functional TR at the time of left surgery is probably still underperformed, so that's something you have to acknowledge and ask for, advocate for. And we don't know yet if catheter valve uh, approaches are gonna change this or not. Thank you.